Allianz have a critical decision to make. Stay the painful course of reform or take a chance on an economy ten times the size of Greece's and hope the recovery comes. A national election in Italy with continent-wide repercussions. This is Inside Story. Hello everyone, I'm Kamal Santamaria. So what do a former communist, a billionaire media man, a technocrat and a comedian all have in common? Well, for what are, in the end, their own reasons, they all want to be the next Prime Minister of Italy, surely one of Europe's most challenging positions, as the country looks to avoid being the next Greece, or Portugal, or Ireland. You get the picture. The fact is Italy has been under what's called unelected technocratic rule since November of 2011. And in those 15 months, the government led by Mario Monti has brought in all sorts of economic and labour changes which have put the squeeze on the Italian people. The reforms, not surprisingly, have been met with disapproval and protest, but they stopped Italy's slide as well. They've kept it away from the dreaded bailout. And so it comes back to that choice again, continued economic pain for, hopefully, long-term gain, or a different approach to growth and jobs creation with no guarantees of success. Here's a quick rundown for you of the candidates in this election. The favourite, first of all, the centre-left leader, Pier Luigi Bersani. His focus is on investment and new jobs, though the polls suggest his Democratic Party may not secure an outright majority, which could let in... The outgoing Prime Minister, Mario Monti, as part of a coalition government, he is the technocrat credited with saving the country from financial crisis. There's the billionaire, media tycoon Silvio Berlusconi in what is his fourth shot at being Prime Minister. He's gone through scandals over his love life and multiple fraud trials, but still has managed to poll well. And finally, the comedian, activist Beppe Grillo. His grassroots campaign has been attracting large crowds and a strong online following. Before we get into today's discussion, here's a few thoughts from our correspondent Jonah Hull, who's covering the Italian elections from Naples. Well, it's an extremely important election, of course, for Italy. Remember, this country has effectively put democracy on hold for the last 15 months since the scandal-ridden collapse of the last Berlusconi government in 2011. Since then, it's been run by uh, a government of non-politicians, of technocrats, led by the economics professor Mario Monti. His job, of course, was to try and bring this country back from the economic brink, where it had threatened to bring down the entire Eurozone with it. Well, that didn't happen. The experts would say that the danger hasn't passed, but the time has come to switch democracy back on again. The problem in Italy is that the main political parties have fallen into deep disfavour with the voters. The voters are scandalised by stories of corruption. They blame the political classes for the economic problem, problems that the country uh, faces. They are angry about austerity at a time of deep and worsening recession with uh, unemployment soaring. And so they may well punish the main political parties, either by not voting at all or by casting a protest vote for this rapidly rising a uh, five-star movement, a non-establishment, non-political party that is basically against everything. The outcome, of course, could mean that this country, which needs very badly strong and stable government now, could end up once again with a weak and fragmented coalition that fails to run the course. This is Jonah Hull for Al Jazeera Inside Story in Naples. Right, let's introduce our panel for today's discussion. Then to Rome, first of all, and Pier Virgilio D'Astoli, who is the president of the European Movement in Italy. In our London studios is Alberto Nardelli. He is an Italian affairs analyst. And rounding out the panel from Washington, D.C., is Thomas Pally, senior economic policy advisor to the American Federation of Labor and the Congress of Industrial Organizations. Gentlemen, I thank you all for joining us today on Inside Story. Let's go to Rome first of all, and we'll start with Pier Virgilio D'Astoli. We've got lots of big issues to talk about. I want to actually talk about a small one today. Looks like it's been very cold in Italy today. Do you think that will affect the voter turnout or do Italians know that this is just too important and that they have to get out there? No, I think that the trend of the voters is not so bad and I think that the Italians understand very well uh, the importance of these elections. So very probably at the end the, the level of the voters will be good. 
as they go to the polls, Pierre, they know that they have had austerity for 15 months now. Would Italians know, though, that they are perhaps better off now than they could have been? That if it weren't for Mr Monti and his technocrat government, things could have been a lot worse? Uh... I, I think that the, uh, it will be very probably uh, an alliance between the centre left and the and the centre. I think that the, generally speaking, uh, uh, the big majority of the Italians will uh, uh, for will be for a change. That means that all the voters uh, that will vote, for example, for Grillo. Uh, they express their will to a, for a change. And the, generally speaking, left is for a change. But very probably left will be not have the majority of the seats in the parliament, so they will need uh, to make uh, a, to uh, organize uh, an alliance with, uh, mm. with the center. So Pierre thinks change. Let's see what Alberto Nardelli in London thinks. As I say, I put the, the point there before that things perhaps could have been a lot worse if the technocrat government hadn't done what it did. Do you think that might just be in the back of people's heads as they go to the polls? I think people will, uh, will definitely um, think about the last 15 months and will, uh, and will definitely think that things could have been a lot worse, which is probably why the centre-right and Silvio Berlusconi's party won't do too well in, in the polls. I absolutely agree that this will be a change election, but I think that <clears throat> the polling figures at least show that that will be uh, less reflected in support for the centre-left, which will actually be quite similar to past elections, but it will mainly be expressed in support for Beppe Grillo's uh, mm. movement. Because one thing that lots of um, commentators, both within Italy and internationally, mm. and also within the centre-left movement it itself, one thing that they often don't realise is that in the past 20 years, Silvio Berlusconi has only governed for about half of that time. The other half of that time, the centre-left has been in, in power. And that's the main reason behind lots of the support for Beppe Grillo's movement and for the fact that despite such a weak centre-right, the centre-left does indeed look like it will need to form mm. an alliance with the centrist coalition. So perhaps a change in personnel, but what do you think about change in direction? You know, austerity is all over Europe. And again, I wonder if people, pre and politicians, as when I say people, I include politicians as well, that they appreciate that to a degree the cuts have got to stay to, to get them out of this mess. I, I do think that the whole context of, of, of austerity will have a large impact. And I think that if you look at austerity within Italy, it's actually less about cuts. It is, it, it is a lot more about very high fiscal uh, pressure. Uh, in, in addition to the much talked about uh, property tax, Italy has one of the highest fiscal pressures uh, for companies. If you look at the total fiscal pressures on, on, on corporation, that nears 70%, and that is one of the highest um, within Europe. So actually, that, that too is a very big point because in, in Italy, voters see this narrative of, of austerity, but they see that the majority of those cuts are not going towards the parties or the political costs uh, or the public sector, but those, th the austerity is mainly being translated into very high fiscal pressure, mm. and that was already there before um, this crisis. And, and, I, and I think that's been the big breaking point in terms of confidence between voters and the mainstream political parties. Thomas Pally in Washington, D.C., let me bring you in. I'm, I'm staying with the past here. Just I want to give Mario Monti's ideas a, a fair airing first before we think about others. You know, do you think that he did the right thing by the Italian people in these last 15 months and that they will maybe not appreciate it but at least under understand why it's happened? Well, it, 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 how to frame this is, is quite difficult. There's, um, you know, you set it up and said w what, what it could have been alternatively, mm. but there's also uh, the, the downside could have been a, a major crisis. And of course, then there's the upside. What if Europe had done it all together differently? Because there is another route out of this crisis. It's a European route. And uh, the question now is uh, how long will voters put up with this position where they've been in, locked into austerity by the arrangements that were set up some 15 years ago with the, with the implementation of the euro. Um, right now, I, I think this is a very transitional moment. Uh, 
Mm. Um, the it, 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 though the uh, the the party that will probably most likely come to uh, power is this Bersani uh, Monti center left uh, coalition, but you do see uh, the Grillo five star sort of populist five star movement uh, populist party on the rise. In Germany, you're seeing the Pirate Party on the rise. In Spain, you had massive demonstrations uh, over the weekend about the huge youth unemployment. So uh, I think things are still very uh, in, in a process of working out. Um, and what will be the patience uh, of European voters to, to stay this course of what actually looks like a, a very, very prolonged stagnation? Because there's, uh, there's no question, uh, uh, prosperity is not just around the corner for Europe. Mm. At best, you see uh, a, a years of stagnation in, in front. And so this is, the, this is the political conversation that is now beginning to develop. It's, it's present in this election. Um, I don't yet, I, I see a protest uh, politics developing. I don't yet see a constructive um, prosperity politics developing. And if, 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 if that, I think, is the... Um, critique of the, the social democratic parties uh, and center-left parties throughout Europe. Uh, for the time being, they're allied uh, with the status quo. Mm. Uh, and I do think that status quo is going to win out politically this time round. But then we must project into the future, and that becomes uh, uh, more worrying. Gentlemen, let's just run through, just take a little pause for a moment and run through some of the key developments that have led us up to this point, just to bring together what all of you have said, actually. Go back to that financial crisis that, you know, effectively caught up with Italy, and we're going back to 2011 here, August 2011, public debt, $2.7 trillion, 120% of GDP, second only to Greece, which is where you don't want to be, obviously. And so we have this $74 billion austerity package that was passed and then, uh, as Thomas was alluding to there, the protests began from that. It hastened the end for Silvia Berlusconi, who resigned as Prime Minister in November 12. And then just four days later, it was the economist Mario Monti who was sworn in at the helm of this new technocratic government, brought in all those sweeping austerity measures and labour market reforms. But a year later, and we've heard this from our guest, with Berlusconi's uh, party withdrawing its support, Monti resigned, and it prompted these early allegiance. Thomas Pally, just back to you really briefly, if you wouldn't mind. Just as we go through that, list of all, Italian voters have been through a lot in the last year. And again, I'm trying to put myself in the, in, the, in the mindset of them as they go to the polls. When they've been through all of that, you know, what do they want out of this? Change seems to be the obvious thing. Is that, is that do you think, what's well, in their minds? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, uh, voters are, are grappling with what are the possibilities, I think. Um, uh, even as you talk to, you know, the, the talking heads like ourselves on this program, mm. uh, there's a, a lot of confusion about what the cause of the crisis is and what possibilities there are. You did mention the debt ratio mm. at the beginning of the crisis for the 20, 2011, 120% of GDP. There's nothing magical about that number. Whether it's sustainable or not depends on two things. First of all, what type of interest rates are you going to have? And then what does your growth uh, profile look like going into the future? Now, Italy has been hammered on both counts of that, uh, uh, there. The design of the euro and the lack of support from Germany for bringing down interest rates meant that Italy has been plunged into a, 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 a crisis of its own, which where the markets drove up interest rates against Italy, worsening its debt position. Had Italy had interest rates similar to what the UK or the US mm -hmm. have, has had, it would have been doing fine. In fact, one of the interesting things looking back before the crisis, Italy actually had quite a responsible um, deficit position, even though it inherited uh, a large debt position. And it also had quite a, a, a good uh, balance of payments position. But all of that has been thrown out of the window. Mm. Uh, and so it, Italy's never been plunged into an additional crisis because of I interest rates. Right. On top of Th that... Thomas, let me just jump it, in there. Sorry. Face, yeah. I, do, I just do want to bring our other guests in and move on to some other, because we've, we've looked at a lot of economics so far. I do want to look at, uh, at personality as well. Pier Virgilio in please, Rome, can please. I come back to you? Tell me about Pier Luigi Bersani. What is it that makes him popular? He's talking about jobs growth and, and, and all these sorts of things, but, I mean, that's what everyone's talking about. What is it that makes him popular? Uh, Pier Luigi Bersani uh, mm. uh, had, have, has a, a very... Uh, uh, high level experience in the government uh, and he showed when he was in the government that uh, he was a very pragmatic uh, uh, political leader 
And I think that uh, he will be able to uh, organize uh, uh, the government, putting together uh, the engagement for a, a new uh, prosperity in Italy and also the alliance with the, um, the reformers people as, uh, as Mario Monti. But uh, an important thing that uh, is related to Pierluigi Bersani is the fact that uh, he could uh, uh, work uh, very, uh, in a very pragmatic way with, for example, with the, Fr the French government, mm -hmm. the socialist, uh, social government, uh, uh, pushing the European Union to go in a different direction than the direction that uh, the European Union made uh, until now. A uh, quick couple of comments I just want to bring to you gentlemen uh, from Facebook, uh, which people have sent in to us. It also ties into the personalities. Um, Katarina Levid says, we actually don't trust anybody this time. Left-wing parties were not able to form an opposition to Berlusconi. Right-wing parties are embarrassing and the technical government is a failure. And we also had this, and this is what I want to talk about, Leo Franzen, who said, as long as it's not Berlusconi, let's hope the Italian people are smarter than that. Alberto Nardelli, in any other country, maybe I not in any other country, but in a lot of other countries, I can't see how a character like Silvio Berlusconi could be running for prime minister for a fourth time. How, how does he keep doing this? I think the first uh, comment that you that you read out is 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 fundamental because if we re sure. rewind back to the financial crisis and the fall of Berlusconi's government, Italy's problems didn't start there. Mm. And if we put aside some of the numbers, but we start looking at things like growth over the past 10, 15 years, only Haiti and Zimbabwe grew at a slower pace mm. than Italy. If we look at the expenditure of Italy's government, some regions in Italy spend more than central governments um, across Europe. Some local councillors earn more than the Chancellor of uh, Germany. Italy's problems go back a lot before 2010, uh, 2011. And <coughs> The blame for those problems is evenly split between the centre-right and the centre-left because both have governed. Silvio Berlusconi is much easier to point fingers at him because the centre-right is embodied within one personality, while on the centre-left the, the captaincy may have changed, but lots of the political leaders and, and the people leading the party are actually funded are actually fundamentally the same. And that's been one of the main reasons why Berlusconi has also been popular to answer your um, even Even with that question, strong single it, personality, he's still got that, I mean, he just seems such a, I mean, you could describe him with a lot of Silvio words. Berlusconi's, <laughs> Silvio Berlusconi's biggest strength has been the weakness of his alternatives. Because every single time the centre-left wins an election, over the past uh, 20 years, it didn't solve lots of the problems that it criticized of Berlusconi. Lots of the deep-rooted structural problems within the country uh, weren't tackled. And thirdly, very often center-left governments didn't last a long time. So Berlusconi would then go back to the electorate and say, you gave them a chance, they lasted a year, they didn't do much, vote for me again. Mm. And that's been his biggest strength up to date. It's been the weakness of the alternatives. Now and both the alternatives are, f are fairly uh, weak, which explains the distribution of uh, votes amongst more than two coalitions right. right now. And just quickly from you, really quickly, just a quick word on Beppe Grillo. D how does he fit into the whole scheme of things, do you think? I think lots of people are, are, are ask, is Beppe Grillo right wing or left wing? When actually, if you look at the data within polls in terms of where his support comes from, it's actually, if we if you look at people who voted uh, Berlusconi's party or the centre-left in 2008, the flows to Beppe Grillo's party are actually evenly split between the centre-left and centre-right. So these are people who don't trust the centre-right or the centre-left because neither has changed over the past few years. So voters are saying, you've both messed up. Mm. Now we're going to vote for something which is completely different, which is a shock to the system. Okay. And that's where his support is coming from. So while we're talking personalities, I do want to look at the economy again, but how it feeds into those personalities, because these elections are crucial to addressing Italy's economic problems. And we're going to show you why right now. Look at these numbers. Uh, not only was there no growth in 2012, the Italian economy actually shrank more than 2%. So whoever wins this election will then inherit a public debt which exceeds $2 trillion. And you've also got more than 11% of the workforce who don't have jobs. Youth unemployment's the bad one, as it is across Europe. It is now at 36%.
Thomas Pally, you're an economist. You tell me what you think. And again, I want to go back to personalities, though, here. Out of the personalities who are there, the people on offer, who do you think actually offers the best chance well, well, for Italy to get out of you, that you, mess, which I just... Hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you, you, you began by the question by who, who's popular. Actually, I, I would be a, a bit cynical here, but I would say that no one is popular. Okay. And that's, in a, 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 a sense, reflected in the anticipated low turnout. The person who has the greatest claim to popularity would be Mr. Grillo. He is attracting a dissident vote and seemed to be offering... Um, mm. he's the, he's the, 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 that's something, to be, get to, at least, to be winning votes instead of losing mm. votes. But on the other hand, it's very unclear what he has to offer other than a statement of protest. Um, <clears throat> the situation economically is not good for Italy mm. uh, because in a slump you need uh, fiscal expansion e even if you've had uh, sort of even if you've got structural problems you don't address the structural su pro uh, problems in the slump you get out of the slump and then you turn around and address right. the type of and, problems and, that and the who do you think has got the mouth to. to get them out of the, the slump from what we hear from the candidates what you see and know of them who do you think's got the goods to get them out of this well, um, I, I think that it, it does sound like the the, the, the Monti Bersani uh, alliance is is most um, directed at, at least uh, on the surface at dealing with that. But on the other hand, I don't see them uh, moving the European agenda enough to create uh, the, the space to make those sort of moves work. Uh, Italy, a particularly industrial Italy is really, really being squeezed by Germany. Uh, if you look at the numbers uh, in the prior 10 years to the crisis, German, uh, Germany engaged in what's called a policy of wage suppression. Mm. Its wage inflation was much, much lower than Italy, Spain, and the uh, other crisis countries. When you tie that together with a fixed exchange rate, which is what the euro is, now we have l locked in uncompetitiveness in Italy and Spain. And how do you reverse that if you can't uh, revalue exchange rate? Well, the Europeans want Italy and Spain to engage in what's called deflation, lower mm. wages, lower prices. But that's a recipe for disaster because can you imagine if you're a debtor, have a mortgage or something like that, and then your wages fall, you're probably going to be pushed into foreclosure. Mm. So the only way out of here is for Germany to engage in expansion. And that's exactly what's being resisted. And so there's a, a, a real economic stalemate. And um, that is what is going to have to be the discussion of the next years. Mm. I think France is going to be critical because if France falls into the same sort of traps that Italy and Spain is in, then it's all over for the euro unless mm -hmm. Germany agrees to change its well, policy direction. Well, Thomas Pally has actually preempted one of my final thoughts quite nicely here, and I'd like to go back to Pier Virgilio in Rome about this. You know, I'm sure you heard Thomas there talking about Germany and France, all these other places. We're talking about an Italian election, and yet it is Europe which plays such a huge role in what the Italians will decide. Again, do you think the Italians understand that, that this is, this is about more than just them, really? Yeah, uh, concerning Europe, uh, my, my opinion is that uh, in Italy we have two, uh, two te uh, three tendencies. One is clearly populist and anti-European, but uh, we have two tendencies. One is for a change in Europe, and that is the position of the centre-left, and one is a position that uh, we need uh, to follow uh, the reform at the Italian at the European level. That is the reason because, as I said before, the alliance between the centre and the centre-left is uh, important. But uh, another thing that we have to take into account uh, is that the centre-left uh, is very different uh, than the centre-left in 2006. It will be new people, new leaders, uh, new members of the government that will take uh, the power in Italy. That change will change the situation concerning the past. What a fascinating election it is. I think any election in Europe is these days. I want to say thanks to all our guests who've joined us. There was Pier Vigilio D'Astoli there in Rome. We had Alberto Nardelli joining us from London and also Thomas Pally was in Washington, D.C. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. And to you, our viewers, thank you for joining us for this edition of Inside Story. You can always send us comments and feedback. Uh, email is the best way to do it. Inside Story at aljazeera.net is our email address. I'm Kamal Santamaru from the whole team. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.